It's a really great pleasure to welcome um, Professor Mimi Scheller from Drexel University, where she is the director of the Center for Mobilities Research and Policy. Professor Scheller has degrees from Harvard, from the New School, an honorary doctorate from Roskilde University. She's the author of books that many of us have read, um, most recently, Aluminum Dreams or Aluminium Dreams, <laughs> depending upon where you're from, I guess. Um, Citizenship from Below, um, The Rutledge Handbook of Mobilities, Mobility and Locative Media. Um, she is a co-founding co editor of the journal Mobilities um, and an associate editor of Transfers, an interdisciplinary journal of mobility studies. So um, a really accomplished scholar um, and uh, one of, the, one of the people who's really um, brought the whole field of mobilities um, to life. Um, and uh, certainly um, the mobilities perspective has had a really profound influence on discipline of sociology, anthropology, geography, um, and urban studies, um, amongst others. Even though Dr. Scheller herself is actually a historian by training. <laughs> so. Um, uh, it's really my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Scheller to speak to the topic of mobility justice. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, um, Pam and Peter and the two programs and the dean. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. It's my first time in Vancouver, and I've been enjoying it despite the rain and seeing a lot of the city. Um, so I am talking about mobility justice. And you may be familiar with the term transportation justice, and that's part of what I'll talk about, but this is gonna be about more than just transportation. Mobility justice, I believe, is one of the crucial political and ethical issues of today, when the entire world faces the urgent question of how to make the transition to more environmentally sustainable and socially just mobilities. All around the world today, the challenges of precarious access to mobility and unsafe or risky mobilities produce the sharpest contours of inequality. And these images suggest you know, both inequalities of streets and traffic, but also of refugee and migrant movements. Urban, regional, and international governing bodies are grappling with a series of crises related to how we move an urban crisis of pollution and congestion, which we're all familiar with, a global refugee crisis of borders and humanitarianism and the kind of limits of humanitarianism today, and a climate crisis of global warming and the need for decarbonization, unless you're Donald Trump, <laughs> sorry. This talk will seek to think across these crises, showing how each is part of a wider disturbance or set of processes in prevailing institutions concerned with the management of mobilities and immobilities. Mobility justice offers a new way to think across the micro, meso, and macro scales of transitioning toward more just mobilities. Current approaches to transport justice and other areas like environmental justice, climate justice, and even spatial justice, I believe, have not connected enough and have not shown um, in enough ways how embodied differences in class, gender, race, ethnicity, nationality, sexuality, and physical ability all influence accessibility and interact with the mobility regimes and control systems that reproduce uneven mobilities, both locally and globally. So I'm going to argue that addressing the injustices of unequal mobilities requires that we develop a deeper understanding of how uneven mobility relates not only to how we move around cities, but also to gendered and racialized colonial histories and neo-colonial presence, along with the geo-ecological and geopolitical bases of mobility in extractive industries, such as mining and energy production. And for me, being here like in Vancouver is um, kind of representative in a way of all the things I'll be talking about. So I'm going to begin just by saying a little bit about the new mobilities paradigm and its relation to thinking about mobility justice. And I want to kind of dedicate this to my um, late colleague, John Uri, 
um, collaborator, colleague, teacher, mentor, not teacher exactly directly, but um, uh, we were together at Lancaster University and um, he died about a year ago. So he's been a great influence on this field and all of the thinking around what we called in a 2006 article, the new mobilities paradigm. Over the past decade, a new approach to the study of mobilities has been emerging across the social sciences, involving research on the combined movements of people, objects, and information in all of their complex relational dynamics. Since our publication of the new mobilities paradigm and the launch of the journal Mobilities with the editorial introduction on mobilities, immobilities, and moorings, in, also came out in 2006, my own work has focused on themes of uneven mobility, inequality, and power. So I want to try to sum up a little bit about what I mean by the new mobilities paradigm um, without going into too much detail, but I think of it in these kind of five ways. It's a new way of thinking about social worlds as emergent from complex and multiscalar mobile relations, flows, circulations, and their temporary moorings. So it's, a, it's in contrast to what we called sedentary epistemologies and what others have referred to as methodological nationalism. So it's kind of about sort of looking at the relations and the, and the movements that constitute the social and social practices. Secondly, mobilities research provides insight into the social practices and the material agencies of contemporary mobile lives. It examines the complex interconnections between physical, virtual, communicative, and imaginative mobilities, including the movement of people, objects, information, capital, resources, et cetera, food, um, as well as their immobilities. So in that sense, it's quite different than the study of transportation kind of per se, right? It's, it's more than that. Thirdly, we also focus on understanding how meanings, representations, and mobility discourses frame phenomena as moving or still, as fast or slow, as mobile or immobile. So it's influenced in a way by a sort of cultural turn, right? So it, it also looks at um, visual imagery, narratives, stories, sort of qualitative um, aspects. Fourthly, it's a method and a collaborative site of action for experimenting with new mobilities, exploring mobility ethics, and in some cases developing explicitly normative frames for instigating mobility justice. Now, not everyone who works in the field sort of does that, but I think for me it's an important dimension of what the field can do and I hope you know, will do. And that means working with um, policymakers, with public groups, with artists, with you know, uh, citizen kind of uh, stakeholder groups to kind of think about how we can, and designers, architects, how we can change the way the world is. And then finally, there's a politics of mobility organized around what um, Tim Cresswell called constellations of movement, meaning, and practice. And mobilities are uneven, differential, and unequal. So they're always political for me. So here's just like some examples of a few publications. I picked ones that had the most you know, colorful covers. It doesn't cover everything. Um, but just to give a sense of um, the way the field encompasses not only you know, travel by people and physical movement, but also imaginative and virtual and communicative travel. And the way in which people live mobile lives, to mention the book by Anthony Elliott and John Uri. And here you see the cover of the journal Mobilities, which I co-edit, the journal Transfers, which I've been closely involved in, the Routledge Handbook of Mobilities, um, John Ari's very influential book, Mobilities, uh, Tim Cresswell's very influential book, On the Move, Peter Aidey's work on mobility. But you'll also see, you know, there's been work um, of different kinds on, say, cargo mobilities or aero mobilities or mobile technologies and mobile communication or art and social sciences in relation to mobility. So by bringing together all of these different kinds of studies um, of transportation, infrastructure, migration, mobile communication, imaginative, tra imaginative travel and tourism, I believe that approaches taking the kind of mobilities turn are able to highlight the relation between what Doreen Massey called local and global power geometries. <clears throat> 
But at the same time, over this decade, it's become clearer, at least to me, that we need both a deeper historicizing of mobility's research in terms of colonial histories and global geographies, as well as what I would call a deeper ecologizing of the material resource bases of mobility in extractive industries. So this leads to these um, key questions for me, the kind of questions of mobility justice. Who is able to exercise rights to mobility and who is not capable of mobility within particular situations? Who is mobile or immobile and why? Secondly, who governs or controls mobility systems? How have sovereign control and disciplinary systems, to use somewhat Foucauldian terms, historically produced differently marked bodies as unequal mobile subjects? What modes of counterpower and subversive mobilities might inform the kinds of moves that can be made to resist, overturn, challenge, or escape these controlling mobility regimes? And finally, how can we support building greater mobility justice? How can people reclaim what we might call the mobile commons? And I haven't quite figured out what that term means, but I'm trying to work with it and figure it out as I go. Maybe you can help me. So in my book, which is in progress, it's kind of drafted, called Mobility Justice, I go into a much more detail kind of theorizing justice more specifically in relation to concepts such as distributive justice, deliberative justice, procedural justice, restorative justice, and epistemic justice. There's many different um, ways of sort of applying uh, ideas, concepts of justice. And I, I can't fully review those here. But I draw on, um, partly on the literature on the capabilities approach, which has certain critiques of a kind of um, libertarian and communal and other kind of philosophies of justice. So um, that's kind of informing the, the, my use of the word um, capability to think about it. And if you think about like distributive justice, it doesn't make sense for mobility to just be distributed to everybody, right? It's not about that we all need more mobility because then we'll just end up, you know, in a big traffic jam or too much pollution. So when I think of distributive justice, I think of distrib distribution of the benefits, but also of the harms of mobility. And when I think of deliberative justice around mobility, I think about you know, how we do decision making, planning, you know, urban plans around transportation, who has a say, who's involved, whose voices are heard. Um, restorative justice comes into play thinking about sort of the effects of pollution and um, climate change and so on that's associated with different kinds of mobility. And epistemic justice is a concept drawn from the climate justice literature um, to think about you know, what counts as knowledge, what counts as a fact when you're kind of um, contesting different views of mobility. But overall, what I try to do is I contrast the concept of transport justice, which I argue is too narrowly focused on transportation alone to really get at the problems we face right now. We can't just you know, try to reduce car use and nudge people to um, use more public transit or bikes. It's, it's not going to get us far enough. And secondly, I argue that uh, the concept of spatial justice, um, for example, developed by Ed Edward Soja, dr drawing on Henri Lefebvre's work, is also too um, focused on like local urban, what he calls meso scale kind of mesogeographical concerns at the level of the city, and it's not very mobile. So that's like the overall argument, but I'll, I'm just kind of summarizing it here. But what I'm, I'll draw from that is this idea of differential mobilities. And I think of uneven mobility as referring to a terrain for movement in which there are, di are divergent um, pathways, differential access, or partial connectivity. That's one way to think of it. But also we could think of means or modes of movement that have um, a greater or lesser degree of ease, comfort, flexibility, safety, right? There's more or less friction, noise, turbulence. Thirdly, we could think about spatial patterns, forms of mobility management and control architectures and infrastructures 
that govern relations of mobility and immobility, speed and slowness, comfort and discomfort. So the kind of built landscape. And finally, local, regional, urban, national, and global systems for control over space, territory, communication, and speed, which produce these differential mobility regimes. And I, and I use an image here of um, New Orleans, right, flooded during Hurricane Katrina. Um, just to think about that, you know, the, there's been a lot written about the sort of injustices of the built um, urban landscape that led to differential effects of the disruption of mobilities after the hurricane. So these uneven terrains bring socio-technical infrastructures to the political foreground because they depend not only on the de design of the built environment, but also on the social practices in which delay or exclusion or blockage or disruption become an everyday experience for those who must dwell in and move through the most marginalized spaces, whether seeking livelihoods or passage through a city or asylum as they're crossing international borders. So uneven mobilities are crucial to processes and forms of what I think of um, as elite secession, right, seceding from space, which underwrite the mobile production of ongoing inequalities. The right to mobility exists in relation to exclusions, exclusions from urban access, exclusions from national citizenship, um, control via policing, borders, gates, passes, surveillance systems, but also through architecture, design, and everyday practices that limit the right to the city or the protection of the state. Even for those within the gates of the city, the metaphorical gates, there may be fragmented public services, hostile policing, and gentrified city centers, as you'll be familiar with, which push the poor to the margins. In the glistening metropolis of densely packed corporate skyscrapers and glass condominiums, only the commodified tourism spaces of urban playscapes and the exclusive zones of elite mobilities and cocooning may occupy the best, cleanest, greenest locations and make use of the newest, fastest infrastructures of transport and communication. Especially in the urban centers of global cities, cities like Vancouver and others, the practices of conspicuous consumption of unfettered mobility of kinetic elites often stands in obscene contrast to those evicted to the margins and peripheries, those unable to access the city, which has increasingly becomes a staged spectacle of elite privilege and tourist consumption. So that's a kind of overview of some of the new mobilities paradigm and the kind of ways of thinking about um, mobility justice. I want to move on now to more specifically looking at different scales of justice. And we're all very familiar with this kind of notion of, you know, cars versus everybody else, right, on, on the scales of justice. Everybody else doesn't have as much um, weight in determining our, our city and environments. And I want to go through um, a kind of broader sense of justice by looking at it across multiple scales, not just the street or transportation. So let's begin first with the bodily scale, bodily mobilities. And here we can think about differential encounters and choreographies that are shaped by and shaping of race, class, gender, age, disability, sexuality. So just think of as you pass people on the street, how you move around, how you interact with people. We're always in our bodies and different bodies have different access to moving in space, right? Whether it's through sexual and gender differences, race and ethnicity and so on. Then there's the kind of street scale mobilities that we're more familiar with in the realm of transport. Um, the uneven accessibility or the externalization of harms of transport infrastructures especially automobility, but including thinking about public transit, biking, walkability, the impacts of ride sharing, the policies such as complete streets or vision zero, and how those are kind of affecting that street scale um, construction of mobility. But then I also like to sort of up the image of these mobility um, systems to the urban scale, 
where we can think about uneven land use and the splintering, what um, Graham and Marvin called the splintering of physical and digital networks and infrastructures, and what Brenner and Schmidt call extended urbanism. Um, and also be beyond our streets, thinking about sea, and there's a rail out there somewhere, um, air mobilities, and vertical mobilities, which you know, cities are, have this kind of vertical space that Steve Graham has also written about recently. Fourthly, there's the national level, national scale of borders and citizenship, of migration, refugee and asylum law, and practices such as interception, detention, deportation. Those are like crucial mobility justice issues today. Um, and we could add to that kind of in the US, the issue around mass incarceration also. <clears throat> and then there's also planetary scales of mobilities. That is the relations of power shaping resource extraction, energy circulation, planetary infrastructures, logistics, satellite systems, and the military power, which is often behind the making of that, um, what Deborah Cohen calls a logistics space. Um, so I'm going to go into a, a little bit more detail about each of these scales. So first, mobility justice begins at the scale of the body. The problem of mobility injustice begins with our bodies and the ways in which some bodies can more easily move through space than others due to restrictions relating to gender, race, class, ethnicity, sexuality, and physical abilities. I use the example of an ad for a runaway slave from you know, the US um, in the 19th century. And it's just a reminder of um, the importance of the histories of slavery and uh, coerced mobility and coerced immobility and how that still informs relations in, in the US. There's an uneven distribution of capacities for movement. And I, I think a good way to think about that is um, Elliot and Ari's notion of network capital, which they define in terms of various capacities to be mobile. So network capital includes things like having appropriate documents, access to passports, visas, banking, um, having money and qualifications to move, having also access to the technology to connect to networks at a distance, right? So, you know, cell phone, satellite technology, and so on. Having a physical capacities for movement in the sort of bodily and physical sense. Having what they call location-free information and contact points. So like being able to sort of reassemble your network of connections wherever you go. And having time and resources for coordination. So all of those things go into like the individual's bodily, you know, capacity to be mobile. They, people have more network capital or less network capital. And Kaufman and Manchelet talk about this in terms of the concept of motility. And they say motility can be defined as the manner in which an individual or group appropriates the field of possibilities relative to movement and uses them. So they talk about it as a potential appropriation where you know, some people have lots of potential to move or to stay still and have things move and come to them. And other people have very little um, kind of capacity and agency to define their own motility to appropriate as in the way they're thinking of it. And I decided I needed to sort of make this more policy relevant by really turning it into a more positive statement of principles of mobility justice. And I'm going to go over these at each of the different scales. And when I think about the scale of the body, this sounds obscure, but it begins with this really important legal principle that comes out of common law called habeas corpus. And it's the right to appear before a court of law and have um, it shown that that person who has arrested and detained you has the right to hold your body, right? It's to, to hold the body. And it's what protects us from just being whisked away and thrown into prison and like never having somebody say why or give us a chance to contest it. And that is at the heart of why uh, slavery is a problem, why detention of people without trial is a problem, why locking people away in Guantanamo Bay prison camp is a problem, because 
habeas corpus is this principle enshrined in common law and throughout the British Commonwealth, but it also exists coming out of Roman law in Europe, other European legal traditions um, in slightly different terms. But it's, you know, it's the basis of personal bodily freedom, basically. Secondly, we could say that each individ individual's mobility shall be constrained by a rule of mutuality. That is, that my mobility does not trample or endanger or deprive others of their capability for mobility. And I mean, it's like a basic you know, thing to teach toddlers, right? You know, like how to walk around without bumping into everybody else. But it's what informs some of the struggles over like street space, right, is that cars are dangerous and they're running down people, or bikes on sidewalks are dangerous and they're running down people. So we have to think about how we have this kind of mutual constraint. Thirdly, individual mobility shall not be involuntarily restricted by threats of violence, including enforced forms of clothing, segregated means of movement, or unevenly applied temporal or spatial limits. And I think of this coming out of both you know, the civil rights movement, the desegregation of public transportation, but also um, feminist struggles um, for women's right to wear different clothing, to be able to move freely. Um, and, and also the um, disability rights movement and critical disability studies, you know, which has, has shown how there's like these enforced exclusions that kind of can segregate people from having access. Fourth and fifth are that gender and sexual identity should not be used as the basis for restricting mobility or exclusion from public space, and racial, ethnic, or national profiling should not be used to police entire groups or stop particular individuals from exercising freedom of movement. So for me, these are like, you could say this is very universalizing, and you know, you can't apply this to every culture and every place in the world, but I'm willing to develop a theory of mobility justice that will positively stand up for these things as like worth protecting. So that's the first scale. Secondly, mobility justice at the scale of the street. This concerns the shaping of built environments and land use, including buildings, streets, vehicles, public transport, and other infrastructures that have long been part of the making of racially segregated automobile dependent cities as well as creating places of class, gender, sexual, and physical exclusion. And I use historical imagery from the US. Um, the urban redevelopment in the city of St. Louis, Missouri is shown there. And of course, St. Louis is the, the site of the famous um, case of Michael Brown and the, and the um, policing of sort of black male movement in the city, like people being t told not to walk in the street. And that ended up leading to his death at the hands of the police, um, and also the segregation of transport. Right here we see the signs and colored waiting room. And this is, um, again, a, a level of mobility justice that I'm willing to try to develop certain principles for. That public systems of transport shall not arbitrarily deny access to some groups as against others by physical barriers or denial of service by race, gender, and ability. Um, and, you know, we have policies that are supposed to ensure those things, but they don't always happen. Secondly, public investments in transport systems shall not afford mobility to some groups by imposing undue burdens, externalities, or limitations on others who do not benefit. And for me, this is one way of thinking about automobility and the problem of cars, is that they, they impose burdens and externalities on others. So there's something unjust about that. C thirdly, cities shall ensure equitable provision of public transit and communication infrastructure through a social benefit analysis, not a cost benefit analysis. And this is, um, I'm drawing this from the recent work of Carol Martins on um, transportation justice. And he develops um, an idea of a kind of population level measure of social exclusion and minimum thresholds of accessibility and kind of argues that we should in ensure through the public investment and um, policies that we ensure a certain minimum level of accessibility for all people. At the top end, you know, he argues, you know, some people privately may, you know, 
drive their fast cars or you know, do whatever, but this, the state's responsibility is to ensure the minimum threshold. And fourthly, that complete streets policies should be developed to ensure that all modes of moving are afforded space and that streets are not dominated by one mode such as cars. Now, I know that's a very contested like, notion at, like, right at the street level. We, I just examined a great master's thesis in urban studies by Peter Marriott um, that kind of looked at the, the debates over that here in Vancouver. Um, so it's not, these things are not easy to achieve, but they're like principles we could sort of work toward, I think. Next, mobility justice at the scale of cities. This pertains to entire extended urban forms, their architecture and infrastructure, including the spatial formation of suburban sprawl, fossil fuel extraction and pipelines, mines, power plants, and toxically polluted peripheries. And I have the cover here from Steve Graham's new book, um, Vertical, the city from satellites to bunkers. And that's a good way to think about this extended urbanism. You can think of it not just horizontally, but vertically from the satellites that enable our communications infrastructure to the mines that give us the metals that we build our cities out of. Um, so here I want to quote um, Deborah Cohen, who, who asks, what might it mean to ground citizenship in the material architectures and social relations of alternative infrastructure instead of the gateways of corporations and nation states? Could repairing infrastructure be a means of repairing political life more broadly? And I think that's a really nice way to sort of think about that. Like, how, how would we do infrastructure differently? And could that help, you know, create a different kind of city? And then I also wanted to quote this um, piece called Disrupt the Flows, War Against the Dakota Access Pipeline and Planetary Annihilation. Uh, that it happened to be at the top of the um, political conflicts at the time I was writing this. And they say pipelines are pieces of critical infrastructure produced to satisfy the energy needs of the global capitalist world. There isn't a way to have operating freeways, stores full of the latest gadgets, military occupations of foreign countries, or super Walmarts full of food, food grown by wage slaves in the global south, south without the oil infrastructure. To be against pipelines is to be against the very world we inhabit. So, you know, they, this is a very activist, you know, engagement with a, a certain kind of struggle, but I think it's a useful way to think about what, what would need to change if, if we were going to address mobility justice at this level. So when we imagine the resilience of cities and mobility systems, we need to go beyond the problem of automobility and think about this idea of spatial secession. And I used this image in the talk I gave yesterday in um, the department about Caribbean futures. And I think of secessionist mobility to secede or break away as elites who are able, what are called kinetic elites, who are able to provide for their own mobility, security, and safety through privatized corridors and special facilities for ease of movement. Secessionist mobility may be as simple as moving to a gated community in an automobilized suburb. And that's the way in which um, I think it's Jason Henderson uses the term to talk about Atlanta. But it could be as elaborate as owning a private island, using offshore banks, and flying in private jets. Right? They're both ways in which kinetic elites kind of cocoon themselves, separate themselves, and provide for their own movement. When these carbon-hungry elites resort to the private jet, the helicopter, the high-speed train, the yacht, the cocooned limousine, or the sport utility vehicle, they externalize the environmental impacts of high-carbon lifestyles onto others. And they also determine spatial development that supports gated enclaves, high-rise towers, sanitized pseudo-urban tourist zones, all-inclusive resorts with private beaches, and spectacles of a kind of consumer capitalism that's often off limits to locals. So for me, Caribbean islands are like an extreme version of that, but you could think of it as the sort of glass towers here in Vancouver also. 
So next, mobility justice at the scale of nation states. This concerns the control of borders, migration, refugee policy, and citizenship, all the forms of visas and passports, of intercepts and securitization, detention and deportation, and now increasingly wall building, which we have seen in full force recently. Um, this image is from a poster for a, a project I did on um, a, a, a series of works by the Chinese artist Ai Weiwei, where he's been working really closely with going, documenting the refugee crisis in Europe, going to refugee camps all over the world, and in this particular series, photographs of refugees using uh, mobile phones and thinking about as people are moving as refugees, how are they staying in touch? How are they doing mobile communication and what does it mean? Um, so that's one of the things I've thought about here. And I'm gonna quote here my um, occasional collaborator, Tamara Vukov, who's uh, at uh, Université de Montréal. And she has written recently about mobility justice, including building a world in which safe, accessible, and just forms of movement and dwelling are open and available to all. Secondly, she calls for an end to the many macro and micro forms of forced mobility and displacement, from colonial and war-based displacements to deportation and evictions due to gentrification. And finally, she calls for the dismantling of imposed forms of in immobility, including detention, incarceration, the legacy of colonial confinement, such as reservations, and separation walls and barriers. And I think that's a really you know, helpful starting point for connecting some of these different issues together and thinking about how mobility justice crosses these different realms. And here, building on that, I started to like, develop these kind of principles at the scale of the nation of mobility justice. That all people shall enjoy a right to exit and re-enter the territory from which they originate, which is enshrined in, in the UN Convention for Human Rights. Secondly, there's a right to refuge for those fleeing violence, persecution, and loss of domicile by war. Again, it's in the UN Conventions, but increasingly not protected. Thirdly, people displaced by climate change shall have a right to resettlement in other countries, especially in those countries that contributed most to climate change. You know, I say, why not? If if you lose your land because of what someone else did, then they, they owe you something for that. Fourth, there's a right to freedom of movement across borders, at the very least, for any temporary purposes defined by law, which is to say, we should be able to move around for tourism or education or temporary work. We shouldn't have people telling us, like, no, you cannot come here. And there are people who go as far as arguing for open borders altogether. And um, I haven't put that in here. I mean, I think it's up for debate. I'm not sure how that would work. But at the very least, there should not be um, laws that are used to exclude entire categories of people on the basis of race, religion, ethnicity, nationality, sexuality, or health status. And we've seen those laws come into force in different countries. We've seen the Trump administration try to bring that in. And luckily, so far, the court's um, trying to stop him. And we'll see what happens. And then finally here, that no one should be detained or deported without due process. And increasingly, there are detentions and deportations happening without people having access to lawyers, without having an appearance before a court, without having a chance to state their claim, say, for asylum. Um, people, it's happening, you know, whether it's in Australia, um, in the UK, where they're using nighttime charter flights to remove um, Jamaicans, for example, um, in the US where people are being detained for very long periods of time and so on. So again, these are like basic principles of mobility justice that I'm willing to argue for. And then lastly, mobility justice at the planetary scale. Global environmental injustices and mobility injustices, I believe, are two faces of the same problem. They're intertwined with this uneven distribution of access and, har and the harms of logistical space, including energy infrastructures, and their impact on the fundamental life requirements of clean air, water, food, and shelter. 
and I, I used two images here that I've, I've used in different um, contexts, but I kind of looked at them and I was like, wow, they really look similar. Um, does anyone recognize where, who can guess, where are, the, where are these two places? You should know the bottom one at least. Tar sands, I heard someone say tar sands. The bottom picture is the Canadian tar sands. Like that's the image we've been shown of it, you know, in the people campaigning against it. Like this is what it does to your landscape. The top image may be less familiar. That's um, Iceland, the building of the Karanjukar hydro power plant in the interior um, wilderness, uh, the high um, Arctic area of, not Arctic, sorry, the sort of, what do they call it? Anyway, inside Iceland. Um, and that, you know, one's hydropower, which is supposed to be clean and green. One is tar sands, which are supposed to be really bad. They end up kind of looking sort of similar. Um, they both have major effects on the landscape. Um, but I want to suggest that global environmental injustices um, are built on this access to energy and the minerals and metals that make up our transportation systems and our cities. The potential for mobility is grounded in where energy for urban life and for transportation is sourced, where it is exported, and who uses most of it. The kinetic elites that I was referring to are monopolizing control over energy, water, and mineral rights, using their power to take global resources that are increasingly scarce. As populations find themselves vulnerable to climate change and threatened with loss of access to water, energy, or food, issues of basic you know, security of, and human survival are increasingly coming to the fore. And um, again, I think uh, Steve Graham has written about this kind of uh, idea of disrupted cities and the way in which urban disasters um, have this potential for um, both political unrest and kind of state securitization processes which are undermining democracy and the protection of rights of various kinds. So as mobility may become rationed or far more expensive due to the politics surrounding the unsustainability of current mobility systems, I believe that the inequalities of what I call network capital will be thrown into sharper relief. That is, those with network capital versus those without network capital. Ultimately, the elite mobilities that are drivers of these kind of uneven global topographies are linked to the geoecologies of energy use and resource extraction. So, at the planetary scale, here's my proposed principles of mobility justice. That climate justice and environmental justice suggest that mobility consumed in one place should not externalize waste or pollution on other regions without some kind of legitimately agreed upon reparations of damages, but also protection <coughs> of non-human entities. Secondly, that the industries and countries that have contributed the most to greenhouse gases and other forms of pollution have a responsibility of reparative justice to limit the impacts of their actions on others and to restore environments as far as possible. Thirdly, protection of the planetary commons, by which I'm thinking of things like the oceans and the seabed, the air and the atmosphere, Antarctica, and extraplanetary bodies like asteroids, the moon. Uh, that I was just in Cape Canaveral at the Kennedy Space Center and there's huge um, investment happening right now in commercial space travel. Um, and NASA's working on its mission to Mars. Um, protection of the planetary commons outweighs any rights to global free trade or private rights to resource extraction. I just, I feel like there is a limit and we have to call it out at some point and say, you can't just keep taking. It, it has to stop somewhere if we're to protect the planetary commons. Next, I think all states should be party to world forums at which carbon budgets are agreed upon and reductions in greenhouse gases regularly measured and met. Obviously, we've been trying to do that. It's not easy. There's forward and there's backward movement happening. Um, and I, but I think it's a principle we should you know, stand up for. And that 
Ideally, a global trust fund should be established into which polluters pay in order to meet the costs of urgent global climate change mitigation. So I don't know if I've covered all the possible principles of justice, and I would love to hear you know, your feedback on uh, what I'm missing or what's wrong with these principles and why it's you know, totally utopian. And I'll end up with this um, image for um, mobile utopia, which I'll say more about in a minute, but concluding with a, a kind of manifesto for mobility justice. If, if we seek to abide by the principles I've outlined, what kind of built forms, social practices, infrastructures, and narratives would support a more just mobility? Where should we direct our attention in building more just mobility cultures and forms of governance across all these scales at once? I have argued that in thinking about bodily space, street space, urban space, national space, and even planetary space, we can extend the insights of mobility research, mobility's research not only into the kind of micro level interactions of transportation at the street level or even the meso level scale of urban politics, but also macro level global relations of unequal mobility. And that, as I said, a combined transition towards sustainable and just mobilities requires more than changing how much energy we use in everyday life. It more fundamentally requires greater equity in the distribution of network capital and capabilities for motility. It is incumbent upon us to expose more thoroughly the relation between such unequal mobility systems and uneven spatialities, not only as forms of control and governance of mobility, but also, I think, as sites of potential resistance. And I, I want to um, kind of end by summarizing this multi-layered politics of mobility that would take action across these different domains. Struggles over everyday embodied relations of racialization, gender, age, disability, sexuality, which inform uneven freedoms of movement and unequal capabilities. Secondly, struggles for the right to the city and the public sphere and what we might call a mobility commons of some kind, often with a politics of occupation and presence in public space that disrupts normalized mobility spaces and maybe offers epistemic alternatives. Thirdly, struggles over ethical spaces for contesting borders, migration, and other kinds of transnational mobility, slavery, trafficking, deportation, refugee policies, and especially doing this in the contested current context of securitization and militarization of borders. And finally, struggles over the just circulation of goods, resources, and energy in a global capitalist system that lacks procedural justice in the distribution of planetary matter and the local environmental injustices of the logistics infrastructures that move that stuff. We don't really have like a space for deliberating over and making decisions at that kind of scale, and I think it's important to develop that. And I will just end with a brief plug for this Mobile Utopia Conference, which is the conference coming up in November 2017 at Lancaster University. And it's sponsored by the Center for Mobilities Research, where I used to, uh, which I co-founded with John Uri at Lancaster when I was there. And this um, T2M, which is the International Association for the History of Transport, Traffic, and Mobility, of which I'm the president and the Cosmobilities Network, which is a kind of looser affiliated network of mobility scholars. And we're all going to get together in November to talk about mobile utopias and do some mobile utopian experiments. Uh, now I'd love to invite your questions and comments. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mimi. Uh, questions, please. There is a microphone as well, and I'd ask you to use that. Maybe I'll get us started then, uh, while people are lining up. Um, uh, so one, one thing that occurs to me um, around this concept of um, uh, mobility justice, and I think a transportation justice frame would be unambiguously about more movement and equal rights of access to movement. So what's the place of um, 
the right not to move in, in, mobil in your sort of thinking about mobility is justice? Yeah. Um, the right not to have to move. Right. The, the right not to have to move, I think, is um, crucial be because there's such a, a link in um, the history of liberal, liberalism and liberal theories that associate mobility with freedom and the sort of um, empowered individual, usually male citizen, has this kind of right to, to movement. And um, for me, because my work comes out of studying the history of slavery and emancipation, I'm always very aware of um, both the coercion of people to move, but also the ways in which people want to remain in place and, and be able to stay with their family or stay on a certain piece of land, right, where they're forced off. And then, of course, thinking about indigenous rights and things like that, um, and First Nations rights to land, right, to not be removed, um, I think is, is crucial. And I always think of, um, I lived in the UK for a long time and was always amused by the stamp, you know, on my passport that, that gave me, um, like, leave to enter, um, kind of at, I forget, Her Majesty's, you know, pleasure or something like that. And it was sort of like, uh, you know, I'm only allowed to stay here because of this um, sort of almost whimsical sounding royal, you know, generosity of some sort. And I, I think people should have um, certain protections of stronger bases to be able to remain where they are and not be forcibly moved. So that's quite different, I guess, than liberal theories and why, for me, it's not always about more mobility. It's also about the right to remain. And one of the early books I co-edited was called Uprootings, Regroundings, Questions of Home and Migration. And um, homing is equally important, and homing and dwelling. If you could come up to the microphone. Hi, thank you very much. I'm curious on your thoughts on enacting this. So it draws on the Paris Agreement and the Sendai Agreement on Disaster Risk Reduction and elements of the UN Declaration of Human Rights. And yeah, how do you see pulling all this together and enacting it? Um, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, so like you said, there are certain um, existing international agreements, and that's certainly a starting point, but obviously enacting it is, you know, the hard part. But from my point of view, just being able to, like, think through and articulate it is, like, step one. Like, first, what are we fighting for? And there's so many things we're critical of, like, well, this is wrong, and this is bad, and this is not fair, and this is unjust. But what are we fighting for, and how do we bring it all together? to actually build coalitions across some of the political movements that are trying to fight for some of these things. And I do believe some of those coalitions are happening. You know, the, the Black Lives Matter movement and the anti-pipeline protests in Dakota, whatever, they, they have quite connected um, analysis of many of these different scales, you know, from stop and frisk policing to um, the problems of mass incarceration and the, and the you know, problems of indigenous people's rights, those, those coalitions are happening from the grassroots. So I guess that would be my hope for like enacting this, is that we keep strengthening the kind of coalitions, but that having the vocabulary and the concepts to be able to talk about it would be helpful. Thanks very much for the talk, Mimi. I really enjoyed it. Um, I, I'm going to ask, I suppose, a kind of selfish question, or just about you know something that was spurred, some of my interests that were spurred. I'm interested in um, in sort of geographies of knowledge, and I I was interested in um, something that you've started to actually allude to in the answer to the previous question. You had said at the beginning you you mentioned this notion of uh, epistemic justice. And then by the end, you were talking about epistemic alternatives, and obviously the answer to the last question gets to that too. But I wondered if you could maybe expand on it a little bit about the, the place of knowledge and knowledge production um, and knowledge mobility, I suppose, in, in your framework and in, in, in how you conceptualize this. Yeah, 
Yeah, thanks. That's, I mean, a helpful question. And I, and I know, like, in, in the back of my mind, um, um, and in certain places, I touch upon ideas coming out of the, the literature on policy mobilities and kind of broadening that to think about knowledge mobilities, I think would be really useful. And, um, and I guess the, you know, at the policy mobility level, it's certainly been clear that there have been um, agencies of city governance, right, that get together and talk, meet up and talk about, you know, these policies, write handbooks, write best practice guides and so on. And then at the, I guess, the knowledge mobilities level, there are these, um, I guess, social movements that share knowledge and that certainly there's plenty of examples of people sharing, um, you know, strategies and tactics for bringing certain issues, you know, onto the political stage at certain moments in time. Um, I think, uh, you know, first peoples and indigenous rights movements have been very effective in doing that across the Americas because I've seen um, coalitions between, you know, people in Central America and Mexico and the Caribbean and Canada and, you know, the, in North America generally where those form, some forms of resistance to certain kinds of um, resource extraction have been happening in the... Um, when I was in Iceland during the, the Saving Iceland protest against the building of the Karanjukur power plant, there was a really fascinating mobilization of people from all over the world where there were um, speakers brought together in a kind of conference and protest camp um, that people came from Trinidad, from South Africa, from India, from um, across different parts of Europe, and they were all engaged in struggles against major um, dam hydropower and, and mining projects. And so they were sharing knowledge with each other, learning from each other. Um, so it, you know, it happens at a very um, grassroots level as well as in sort of, I think, urban governance level. Um, going back to a question on uh, related to implementation within our electoral democratic regime, which is a tricky one, uh, where there's this constant sort of idealization or hope, um, even if it's internalized and not vocalized, to, to become part of the elite and to have that elitist secession uh, and, and be part of that secessionist mobility um, universe. Um, I think I share your, your utopian vision for where we want to go, but I'm interested in your perhaps a utopian vision for how we're going to get there and for the process mm -hmm. to move through uh, what we need to move through apparently in electoral democracy uh, to get to a point where people are, are, are going to be willing to, to, to perhaps give up on the American dream and not think that they too are one day going to have a Hummer and they're going to be able to be um, you know, secessionists from everyone else. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm, I'm always amazed at the, the constant... Um, comeback of of that dream of that desire, and I feel like in back in the 1980s, um, we we knew about climate change, like we knew about greenhouse gases. We were are talking about you know smaller cars and biking more, and and certainly that came out of movements in the 70s um, that were very more utopian movements. But it's like, and that somehow. In the United States in the 1980s, we ended up with, you know, bigger cars and lower fuel efficiency and higher speed limits on our highways. So there, there's, in our democratic politics, there's a constant back and forth. And, you know, we see Obama's um, executive orders and, and various acts all being reversed now by Trump. And, we, I mean, all I can say is, God, I, I, I hate that that's how electoral politics works, but I hope it swings back the other way. And that at the um, extreme, I guess you could say, there's an idea um, I sometimes have written about by um, the philosopher and architect and innovator designer Buckminster Fuller. And he talks about emergence by emergency. And that he, he had very developed ideas about um, like mining and energy and, and how we would kind of move forward on Spaceship Earth, as he first named it. Um, to be more efficient in our use of resources and energy. And he thought that humans would eventually, through emergency, let our, our technologies evolve in a way that we would um, 
emerge towards a better way of living on the earth. I mean, it's kind of utopian, and he was kind of a technologist utopian too, but sometimes I think we'll get there when there's enough of an emergency, and we have to get there. Hi, thanks. Uh, thanks so much for your talk. Um, I'm trying to square the tension um, that, I'm, that I feel between this idea of um, more and more mobility, more access to um, you know, ways to get around, more freedom for people who want to get around, um, and the environmental cost, right? So presumably, if you have both of those at once, they're, they're really going to clash up against one another. Um, and I think, it, it, I think that you started to address that sort of at the very, one of the very last slides where you were sort of talking about, you know, if people want to go, then they have to, there has to be a kind of trade-off, right? So I, I wonder how you, like, how does that, if you could just say a little bit more about that, because I just, you know, I think about the contradictions that we are all inhabiting. I mean, we should maybe all stop going to conferences or something, right? Like, let's not, right? <laughs> I mean, we, are, we embody this kind of contradiction in a way. Um, yeah. So I, I wonder how, I would just want to hear you talk more about that. Yeah, um, no, absolutely. And I've, I've had um, a terrible year for flying a lot. And, you know, it's like I, I am the kinetic elite. If I'm going to criticize it, it's academics are some of the worst. And um, some academics refuse to fly. I mean, there are no fly conferences. Um, our, teleconferencing equipment is not all it ought to be, you would think, at this point in time, to actually be able to meet um, successfully. Um, but, I mean, I, more, more generally, though, I think the, what I see is one of the problems, I guess, in the movements for accessibility and, like, transportation justice is sometimes it does seem like they're saying, you know, like, that we all need more access and more mobility. And part of what I see happening in, in the US built environment is that we end up with a lot of places that are accessible to wheeled vehicles. And in the US that often means cars and like everywhere has to be accessible to a car with a ramp um, because say a wheelchair user or something is going in and out of, because it's such an automobile dependent society. They're, they're using cars more than buses. And, and so you end up with this um, built environment that just makes for like more and more movement. And I think unless we talk about, we do need to talk about constraining some kinds of movement, limiting some kinds of movement. Um, there's you know, some interesting work done in, um, uh, the, there's a project that Tim Cresswell and Pete Aidey have been directing called Living in Mobility Transitions, and they're talking about the notion of um, scarcity and like mobility scarcity and what gets seen as scarce, like space, street space is scarce, or um, that we have like to uh, scarcity of oil, like we get to peak oil, and then how that is the discourse of scarcity is used to talk about different kinds of austerity and what kinds of mobility austerity get politically argued for and which are like never on the agenda. And I think that's one direction to sort of think about that, that contradiction that we're all living in. I almost have a fully formed question. Um, gonna lay it on you. <laughs> um, I was a little bit curious um, about your, your strategy, about those different kinds of justice, and whether it was kind of a, an intellectual strategy for a typology kind of thing, or if it was, or if there's sort of a logic underlying it a little bit. Um, and then as I was thinking about that, um, building on the last couple of questions, um, I was thinking about, you know, justice frictions, um, when one kind of justice contradicts another kind of justice, and certainly um, across scales, um, I really appreciate, I'm fascinated by your um, willingness and passion for connecting uh, mobilities and immobilities across scales. Um, but sometimes it seems almost kind of overwhelming and it's, um, I'm wondering if you have thinking around what if justice um, at one scale contradicts um, a justice at another scale. And certainly the, the contradiction between sometimes um, the ecological 
um, the health of ecosystems, the health of non-human life, um, when that is at stake, but is in contradiction with um, the flourishing of a human population. Um, and finally, to wrap up this rather open-ended question, um, I was thinking about the utopian finish. Um, if there is, and the emergency aspect that just came up, um, it does seem like the case that humans really cooperate and collaborate when they're facing a threat, an external threat, um, like a war, something like that. I'm wondering, I mean, is that um, a model we can kind of think about, um, all of humanity somehow coming together because the health of the planet is at stake? And if so, I mean, I'm really curious. Can't wait to go to uh, Lancaster in the end of the year. Um, how can a utopian thinking contribute to that epic um, coming together? <laughs> yeah. Um, no, those are tough questions. I mean, the you know the different kinds of justice. Um, so like I had been throwing around for a while the word mobility justice and kind of thinking about it, and then at some point when I said, okay, well maybe I should think more carefully about what I mean by that, I turned to the vast literature on justice, and it's all it's huge. It's all over the place. There's a million different ways in which the word justice gets used. And so it actually becomes really hard to organize it. And so for me, I found that I had been thinking about these like uneven and differential mobilities at different scales. And it just made sense if I was going to organize an idea of mobility justice to think about it at the different scales. Like it just as a, a way in to trying to organize all these sprawling different concepts of justice and theories of justice. Um, and uh, I think there's no consensus really in the literature on you know, how to use the, all the different concepts and what their relation is to each other, but I, I do like your idea a lot that one kind of justice can contradict another, because that's certainly the case. Um, but ultimately, I mean, when you say, you know, what about the contradictions of human flourishing as compared to ecological systems and non-human life, Ultimately, we, our flourishing depends on ecological systems and non-human life also. So in the end, we might temporarily think we're flourishing, but you know, we're not flourishing really if we're killing the planet. So maybe the contradictions are a good starting point for like figuring out what's wrong here. You know, if, there, if there's a contradiction between what we're doing and the planet surviving, we, we need to do something differently. Um, so contradictions are good to work with. Um, and the idea of people only cooperating in the face of threat reminds me of um, another uh, wisdom from Buckminster Fuller was that he came up with this um, idea called the world game. And the world game was this, um, before the kind of data collection existed to actually do it, it was this idea that you would get data from like all over the world and you would gather people together and they would like be able to sit down and sort of play a game where they kind of figured out, well, if I take resources here and use them there, like how can I do it in the best way? And I mean, for him, that was um, like less is more and being more efficient with our use of resources. And he thought through this game, we would be able to sort of do that in a way. And there's people who are still trying to develop that concept now, um, some of his early collaborators are still going and they're trying to do it with modern, you know, computing and informatics and big data. And um, to me, that's like a kind of, again, it's like kind of utopian, but it's, it's a vision of how would people cooperate at this kind of scale to figure this thing out. And I mean, the, and the image of Spaceship Earth is um, helpful for like thinking about the, the scale in which we need to cooperate. Uh, thank you for your talk. I'm wondering if you can expand on the mobility experiments that you mentioned at the conference. I was curious. Oh, yeah. So I can't wait to find out exactly what they're going to be because there's um, a really cool people at Lancaster who are like artists and science technology studies people and different kinds of design innovation as well as like social theorists. And they're coming up with these... Um, what they're calling mobile utopian experiments. And they're somehow going to have us enact 
alternative mobilities. And what exactly that will be, I don't know yet. We're waiting to find out. Um, but it might be as simple as, for example, making um, like a, a petty cab style rickshaw available on campus during the conference for people to like get around in. Just, and it's like that idea of um, like tactical urbanism and I think they're probably drawing on that, like small interventions that demonstrate to people what might be possible. Um, maybe there's gonna be some solar powered vehicles you know, that kind of thing, on, on a, just as a, a way to have a conversation while enacting some kind of alternative mobility to help us think in an embodied and physical way about moving around differently. I think that's what they have in mind. So kind of building off uh, Nick's question, um, in terms of um, uh, your discussion of uh, national mobility uh, justice, um, one of the controversies that I uh, kind of uh, felt um, involves um, maybe we call like an uneven distribution of um, products and markets uh, for mobilities uh, between interconnected markets of producing countries and consuming countries. Um, so kind of, I'm coming at this from a drug policy perspective where Colombia is a major producer and therefore committing, like, creating lots of greenhouse gases, but they would argue that the United States and the international market, because they're the ones consuming these products, have more responsibility to cut down on their kind of side of this equation in order to lower these kind of ecological risks and social risks. Um, so how would uh, potentially, an, uh, a potentially an economic or social distribution um, that's kind of found in your argument take into account these initial uneven kind of power relations between various different countries that might have to take on this bigger ecological risk but come from kind of a socially disadvantaged position? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Um, so, so, right, this is where you have to get, um, I think, people in the room together to try to figure out how this would work out. And, um, I mean, we 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 work, our markets work, like, under the rules of, like, the World Trade Organization and, you know, inter-regional agreements, like, you know, NAFTA or whatever, or the European Union, and those rules are determined in certain ways about how those markets work. And I think they, we could sit down and talk about what would be a different way of determining the rules of the markets that take into account um, the ecological impacts and the, um, what are called the externalities of the movement of goods internationally. And um, I mean, I think it's gonna depend, you know, case by case, object by object, mode of transport by mode of transport, like how this would work and even, I mean, the effects of um, I, like agriculture is huge and, and different kinds of um, cultivation when like we have policies, for example, to use ethanol and, you know, what does that do to markets for corn or for sugar, you know, on different parts of the world and things like that. Um, but I think we're able to talk about those things in a smarter way if we are able to put them into the bigger context. Okay. I was just thinking about, um, you know, as you're talking all these questions, I'm thinking about the notion of utopia um, and I'm a historian, and so I was thinking about, and I work on media, and so I was thinking about the kind of utopian languages um, that accompany the introduction of new technologies, right? So, um, you know, when new technologies are introduced, suddenly there's this idea that, um, you know, their proper and, and effective use will solve all of our problems and make us all sort of act more like a community and, you know, all of those kinds of things, and so I'm wondering um, about 
your use of the term utopia and you know what is it what is it meant to do is it a kind of a kind of political gesture is it really are you really thinking about a utopia i'm just i just would love to hear you talk more about that yeah i actually um i was puzzling over that myself and because we had titled our conference mobile utopias and i um circulated a, a specific call for papers for a panel on mobilities and utopias because I'm trying to work that out. And one thing I was thinking about was how the earliest, um, what we call utopian writing, say like Thomas More's Utopia um, or Daniel Defoe's um, work, you know, Robinson Crusoe or something like that, we, the, the utopias are always set on like faraway islands and there has to be some kind of movement a sailing ship or something to get to those faraway islands where utopia can exist. So like utopia and mobilities have this weird relationship already from the beginning. And then when you talk about, yeah, like technological utopianism, um, and certainly someone like Fuller was accused of that by, by others who said, well, we just need to actually slow down and use less technology. Um, the, uh, a socialist writer named Ivan Illich you know, said like that we'll only have just societies when we all move at the speed of a bicycle. Um, anything faster than that produces injustice by, you know, definition. And so I guess for me, utopia is, um, at the moment, I'm drawing on certain ideas. I mean, in the conference theme, was draw drawing on ideas from um, design thinking and um, like critical design theory and kind of, how um, experimentation and enacting things with different kinds of practices can help trigger different ways of thinking. You know, be, help us be more creative, help us you know, think outside the box, to use the cliched term. But they're, they're like little, those are mini utopias, I guess, as opposed to a faraway island kind of utopia. So it's a much more, I guess, a kind of pragmatic kind of utopian thinking, if there's such a thing. I can't help thinking that um, the right to be cold is relevant here. Again, with the, um, you know, the, the, I guess if I think about the, 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 the list of rights, the, the main constraining right on, on, on other mobility is the mutuality clause. And I, I, I can't help wondering if there, if there isn't a requirement for more constraint. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I do think so um, in the sense that our planet does have limits and so we live within constraints and, you know, if our, if our atmosphere can no longer support human life, well, well we, we need some constraints on what we're pumping into it. Uh, so that to me seems almost like um, de facto, like, uh, you don't even need a really deep argument to put to argue for those kinds of constraints. Now the problem comes in, I guess, at the you know epistemic level of well, who who believes that and who determines that? Who you know? Do we believe the science? Do we believe the facts? Apparently, a lot of um, U.S. Americans don't, and um, so then you get to like a struggle over well, what what's the you know what's the definition here of what our limits and constraints are. Um, and that's at that sort of planetary scale. I mean, I think at the bodily scale, there's probably a case to be made for certain kinds of constraints also of um, just face-to-face you know, -face interactions with people. I mean, we have social constraints on, um, you know, personal body space or how, you know, eye contact, things like that. Like, it's built into our cultures to have certain constraints. So. Um, it's, it is, I think it's part of human culture to have certain kinds of mutuality and maybe we just need to think more um, carefully about that at these different scales and what the transportation mutuality would look like or how would it be enacted. 